I used to work in an Alzheimer's clinic when I was trying to get into medical school. And once in a while, these older folks, they would have dementia. Parts of the brains would literally wither, like the flesh would wither and hidden painting abilities would come out. And I'm not talking like they're gonna be at, in, in a museum at some point, but a dramatic change in, their, in the way they wrote, in their ability to paint landscape. And those kind of things make me think there's a lot of untapped potential. And you learn that there's so much going on in the brain that we are not seeing on the daily levels. Anything difficult where you have to think is good for your brain. If you ask Usain Bolt, how do I get stronger legs? Run. It, it's intuitive. But the flesh in our skulls, it's meant to think and feel. That is the power of self-growth. And it's a thinking machine that you actually have to use. If you're not using parts of it, it'll program itself to let those parts of the garden wither. Mm. So the diversity of thinking and the depth of thinking just one level past what you're used to is the way to keep the whole garden flourishing. It's a garden and you have to irrigate it and stimulate and tend to all the corners, particularly the ones you're starting to neglect. Maybe it's your left hand. Getting out of the box and engaging the recesses of your mind is the most important thing. And then you have the creative things happen. You don't just sit down and have them happen. You gotta work and dream and go hard. And on top of that, something creative can happen. Mm. So now we have the understanding that the brain is meant to think. The brain is also meant to command your body to move. The minute you don't use your left hand, the right parietal lobe with the motor strip says, I'm not gonna use much. I'll shave down that density of those brain cells a little bit. So that's where movement's important. So simple things like you know using the mouse with your left hand and using your phone with your left hand mm -hmm. it's a powerful technique and then the other thing is navigation navigation is in the temporal lobe and they have dementia in that area navigation also is uh, spatial awareness is a function of the brain and sometimes when we're on our phones too much we don't have that so my kids i tell them don't look down try to just remember our route and just look up and see how see how far you can get i think those habits will help us as we get less young the other element is brain training it doesn't have to be some weird weird game that's not intuitive. I think brain training just means learning as a habit, one step past where you're comfortable. If you're reading it, you know it, your brain's an, it's an idol. If it's too hard, it's not even engaged. It's, it's, I'm not, I'm not even gonna win this race. I'm not gonna kick it in second gear. Just like video games, just good enough to get to the next level, right? They don't hit you with the fifth level, the tilt level up front. It's level one to level two, level two to level three. And that's what learning is. It's just that level right beyond you that is brain training. So you don't have to buy an app. You just have to challenge yourself and think. If you wanna kick the mind died into next year, I don't want to just stave off brain degeneration, right? What if you wanted to work on focus and cognition? When you go into the big neuroscience journals, they speak about intermittent fasting. Your brain's a hybrid vehicle. It grew, it evolved through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of lots of food scarcity. You didn't eat all the time. And so it's got a backup mechanism called ketones. So after 16 hours, if you don't put glucose in and the liver's done releasing the glucose it's held onto, then it'll start burning fat. They'll clip off those oxygens and hydrogens and they'll make ketones out of it. Intermittent fasting can also help you lose weight, but it's the way the brain prefers to get its fuel source. So I was in Ukraine. When they don't have medicine or a type of seizures, they would just feed them all fat diet. So something about an oh. all fat diet forcing you into just using ketones. Intermittent fasting is back and forth, glucose and then ketones, glucose and then ketones. But for kids, if you just get them almost nearly all ketone through an all fat diet, their seizure rate go down. You know, so that's proof that food changes mind because the mind is the electricity sparking through that flesh. Food will change the electricity in your brain. Food affects mind, food affects brain. With that premise, we can talk about mind diet will hold off dementia and intermittent fasting might make you feel like you've had a cup of coffee once you get in a rhythm. Out. It's not going to make you smarter, but it'll bring you to your most focused, to bring you to your most attentive. It's not, oh, I'm intermittent fasting and now I can do physics. It's not like that. It's your personal best. And then the habits you demonstrate to your family by trying to be at your personal best. And then your kids see that and your friends see that. And I think that's how you impact generation change is to have capable people demonstrate, hey, it's not hard and this is the best we can do for ourselves. The way I think habits function is that because it's such an energy hog, it wants to be efficient. So this whole myth about you only use 20% of your brain. No, we use 100% of our brain and pictures show that. But to get things done, we might only use 15. To get something complicated done, we might only use 35. Otherwise, you wouldn't be an efficient animal or human in the society. Savannah, if you couldn't really control this important, but not having it in fifth gear all the time is an evolutionary strategy, in my opinion. So then it falls into ruts because efficiency is about ruts, like dominoes falling in a certain path. As you grow, the way the electric electricity flows, the way the connections uh, prioritize is a bit like skiing down a mountain, where if you see something, you see a cliff, fear. 
it goes down a certain path. And every time you do that and you've reinforced it, it actually becomes less expensive energy wise to follow and fall into that habit. So these pathways, these habits in our mind, these rituals, these things that are good for us, we want to hold on to those. But a lot of them have become deeply carved, you know, routes down the mountain and filling those in, burying them and finding healthier ones is going to be an energy expending process. The effort will be harder in the beginning. And then as you create a new route down the mountain, you can condition yourself to having more favorable and constructive responses. That's the best way way I can explain is why effort will lead to change and your most effort will be spent in the beginning and then you can change your emotional and cognitive responses by conditioning yourself to find a different different route down the mountain you were born with more brain cells than uh, as a kid than you are as an adult you were equipped with a lot that we can't hold on to you're going to reinforce the ones that you're using and the ones you don't use your brain will say i don't need to hold on them because they're just using energy but the plasticity is we start off with more brain cells than we hold on to yet we get smarter and we get more coordinated as we lose brain cells that's the example that shows you that it's about the connections and reinforcing those mm -hmm. patterns i hope that empowers people to be like wait a second it's not a static thing and much i would exercise for my body there are things maybe i should do for my brain and mind especially while the window is still here uh, to set those in action and make them constructive habits. There's no doubt that the ability, this plasticity we're talking about is highest in your teens. And that's actually when you get a lot of mental health disorders, a weird thing. The most dynamic shape-shifting is in adolescence. So we come into our identity, but we also a peak of mental health issues. So you're sort of setting your, your cognitive and emotional thermostat. And then 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, it does slow down, but it doesn't wither to zero. The exercise stuff is in its own way the most important if we can get back to that. Keeps your brain arteries open, releases all these neurotrophic factors inside your brain. So not just the plumbing that irrigates the flesh of the brain. To keep the flesh healthy, you have to irrigate it. And that has to do with your brain arteries. And you exercise and it releases it, it showers itself. It's not like the thigh muscle sends it up to the brain. The brain says, hey, I'm feeling good. This is good. I like this. I'm going to create a new rut. I'm going to remind you, you feel good when you run. The brain will shower itself with growth factors. There are growth factors. The brain says, hey, the electrochemical balance is better with those. So I think that's where you get the runner's high. You know, it's not just adrenaline. It's not dopamine is a happy chemical. I'm jacked up. I'm on adrenaline. It's just such a complex ecosystem. And rather than feeling intimidated by that, to me, I just see opportunities on how people can, you know, improve their lives.